Hi, welcome back. I've been promising more videos on Virgil's in here to get us started this term and today I wanted to pick a really really key theme that you're going to see throughout the Aeneid. Is Aeneas a mama's boy? So in epic poems we tend to see gods taking on a champion and Aeneas isn't special in this regard. Odysseus has Athena as his champion in the Odyssey and Achilles in the Iliad has his own divine mother Thetis who's a sea nymph supporting him throughout the Iliad. So it's only fitting and right, really, that Aeneas should have his mum, Venus, backing him up throughout Virgil's Aeneid. But the amount of support that she gives him to a modern reader is a little bit jarring. We have very different expectations of our heroes, perhaps, from ancient readers. So let's scratch the surface and see how, when and why Venus gets involved to support Aeneas on his journey. We see Venus supporting Aeneas at the very, very beginning of the Aeneid. In book one, she approaches Jupiter to beg him to save Aeneas. In book one, the Aeneid is kicking off with a storm. So, I sing of arms and of the man, arma wurumque cano, very, very first line of the Aeneid. And so we begin in a world of turmoil. Things are already difficult for Aeneas right at the very, very beginning. And so Venus entreats Jupiter to look after her son and save him. And we see this in book one. She says, You that with eternal sway rule the world of men and gods and frighten with your bowl. What great crime could my Aeneas, could my Trojans have wrought against you, to whom, after many disasters born, the whole world is barred for Italy's sake? Surely it was your promise from them sometime, as the years rolled on, the Romans were to arise. From then, even from Tuca's restored line, should come rulers to hold the sea and all lands beneath their sway. What thought, Father, has turned you? So we can see there's a bit of emotional blackmail going on from Venus here. It's foretold, it's fated, Jupiter has promised that the Romans will be born from the Trojans. And you'll sometimes hear, you'll sometimes read the Trojans referred to you as Teu uh, from Teuca or Teucrians. It's another way of saying Trojans that's more elevated and formal. So Venus is really in Aeneas's corner on Jupiter's case to deliver on this promise. And it's setting up the premise of the epic to come. So she's getting involved because Aeneas is in trouble. He's in a storm at sea. She's getting involved to hold Jupiter accountable for his promise. So she's approaching him as a suppliant. She's entreating a superior god. And... To be fair, to her credit, she's kicking off the plot. <laughs> so within the plot itself, what she's doing is justified. But as a reader or a listener of the epic, we can see that Aeneas is setting up key themes. Aeneas is the one who is going to become the founder of Rome. And Aeneas is the hero who is deserving of being saved. We see this sort of thing again in book five. In book five, Venus intervenes and begs Neptune to calm the sea for Aeneas. Book five isn't necessarily one that everybody reads for um, A-level, but this is the funeral games for Anchises. That's the general theme and overarching story of book five in Virgil's Aeneid. Once more, Aeneas is at sea, and here Venus isn't approaching Neptune as a superior god, but just a more relevant one, because he's steering the sea for Aeneas. Something we see his Greek equivalent Poseidon doing all the way throughout the Odyssey towards Odysseus as well. And here Venus approaches Neptune and tries to play the gods' interests off against one another. So she approaches Neptune and says... Juno's fell wrath and implacable heart constrain me, O Neptune, to stoop to every prayer. Her no lapse of time nor any goodness softens, nor does she rest, still unbent by fate in Jove's command. It is not enough that from the mists of the Phrygian race in her fell hate she has devoured their city and dragged through the utmost vengeance the remnants of Troy, the very ashes and dust of the slaughtered race she still pursues. The causes of such madness, be it hers to know, you are yourself my witness. What sudden turmoil she has raised of late. So you can see here that Venus 
is really kind of playing for the sympathy card when she's speaking to Neptune. She's talking about everything that Juno has done because Juno has got a huge grudge against the Trojans and Aeneas himself. And this is the predicament the gods are in. Venus is paying the price because before the Trojan War, Paris had to judge between three goddesses. He had to choose who was the most beautiful between Minerva, Venus and Juno. So Paris has promised different gifts from different goddesses and it's Venus who promises Paris the most beautiful woman in the world as his wife. And this is how the Trojan War begins. Paris picks Venus and in turn marries Helen of Troy. So on the face of it, a really good bargain, but we know how that really turns out and it's, it's not that great. So Venus is really paying the price for rigging the beauty contest before the Trojan War. And here she's kind of playing the sympathy card with Neptune to calm the seas for Aeneas. So in the first part of the Aeneid, which we've said is all about wandering, Venus really intervenes to help Aeneas gain safe passage at sea. It's quite a light touch, to be honest, and she's not getting too involved. However, in Book 8, Venus begs Vulcan to make Aeneas some new armour. Now, this isn't completely unheard of, and we see a really, really similar thing in the Iliad. So, Book 8 in the Aeneid is when Aeneas receives his shield, the shield of Aeneas, and we'll talk about this time and again in different videos. I'm going to talk about it in the Augustan Anachronism video that I'll link below. Aeneas receiving a shield from Vulcan is part of his mum's manipulation, but it's not completely unheard of. We see Thetis do the same thing for Achilles in Homer's Iliad. So Thetis goes to Hephaestus and begs him for new armour for her son in order to allow Achilles to resume the fighting. In the Aeneid, Venus does the same with Vulcan. She approaches Vulcan for special armour for Aeneas to fight with. The key difference is that whereas the artwork on Achilles' shield is more thematic, the artwork on Aeneas' shield includes lots of historical anachronisms about the founding of Rome. So the sites that will be Rome, the key events in Roman history appear on these different panels. But what we see as well is Venus's manipulation of a lame husband Vulcan. Remember, they already have a relationship that Thetis and Hephaestus in the Iliad don't quite share. And we see this in Book 8 when Venus begs Vulcan to create a shield for Aeneas. But Venus, her mother's heart dismayed by no idle fear, moved by the threats and fierce uprisings of the Laurentines, addresses Vulcan. And in her golden nuptial chamber thus begins, breathing into her words divine allurement. While the kings of Argos ravaged Troy's dooms to towers in war, and her ramparts that were fated to fall by hostile flames, no aid for the sufferers did I ask, no weapons of your art and power, no dearest husband, I did not wish to put you or your endeavours to work for nothing. Heavy as was my debt to Priam's sons, and many the tears I shed for Aeneas sore distress. Now by Jove's commands, he is set for in Rutulian territory. Therefore I, who never asked before, come as a suppliant, and ask alms of the deity I revere, a mother for her son. So we can see Venus is really, really skilled in manipulation. She is able to persuade Vulcan, to create and forge arms for her. And notice the way Virgil writes Venus. She's very alluring here, so it's partly a seduction of her husband. And it's kind of the way you can imagine a husband speaking to, um, a wife speaking to a husband, pardon me, because she's saying, look, I've not asked you for a favor so far. You owe me one. I've kept this in the bank for right now. And that's not unlikely because Troy was fated to fall whereas Aeneas is fated to found Rome. So if you're going to use your favours, you may as well do them in accordance with fate because you cannot change the outcome of fate. So here we see Venus being very, very smart and providing Aeneas with armour. So, so far he's had support in the storms in books one and book five, and he's also had um, a new set of armour in book eight. And throughout the fighting, throughout the battles, Venus becomes perhaps even more involved with Aeneas. So when we turn to book 10, we see Venus begging Jupiter again, not to protect Aeneas, but to protect Aeneas' son, Ascanius, from Juno. So Ascanius at this point is coming of age, 
Ascanius's other name is Julius <laughs> or Julius um, and so he pro provides a connection with Julius Caesar and we'll talk about that more when we look at book two of the Aeneid. But she's trying to beg Jupiter to save her grandson and save the destiny of Rome. So it's only really in book eight when she talks to her husband that we see her being very, very personal about Aeneas. Elsewhere, she chooses what is going to manipulate the different gods the best. Here, Golden Venus makes reply to Jupiter. Father, eternal sovereignty of men and things, for what else can there be which we may now entreat? Do you see how insolent the Rutulians are, and how Turnus is born conspicuous through the crowd upon his chariot, and rushes in swollen pride along the tide of war? Okay, so she's really hamming up the advantage that the Rutulians seem to have in battle. She's becoming really concerned for the safety of her descendants. And it's here that she stands up for Ascanius as her grandson, which we kind of would expect her to do. If there is no country for your relentless wife to bestow upon the Teucrians, by the smoking ruins of desolate Troy, I beseech you, Father, let me dismiss Ascanius unscathed from arms. Let my grandson still live. Aeneas, indeed, may well be tossed on unknown waters and follow wherever fortune points out a path. Let me avail to shield this child and withdraw him from the dreadful fray. Amanthus is mine, mine Hypathus and Cythera, and Idalia's shrine here, laying arms aside, let him live out his inglorious days. Bid Carthage with mighty sway crush Orsonia, from Orsonia shall come no hindrance to Tyrian towns. What has it availed to escape the plague of war, to have fled through the mist of Argive fires, to have exhausted all the perils of sea and desolate lands, while his Teucrians seek Latium and a newborn Troy? Would it not be better to have settled on the last ashes of their country and the soil where once was Troy? Restore, I pray, Xanthus from Simois to a hapless people, and let the Te Teucrians relive once more the woes of Ilium. She's harping on the same chord every time she talks to a god. She's bringing up the Trojan War again and again and again. And to be fair, it was a big deal. We've seen it in quite a lot of detail in book two when Aeneas tells us the story. And here she's bringing it up. Look, they've been on wanderings for years. My grandson Ascanius has come with them. What was the point in all that if we're going to wipe out the race? You promised that you would let my kids found Rome. What's the crack? And you can't really disagree with her. We saw in book one that actually Aeneas and Ascanius are fated to found Rome. And we notice that at the end of the Aeneid, and this is a big spoiler alert, Rome isn't founded in a day. Rome wasn't built in a day. What they do is they establish a territory in Latium. Ascanius will develop into Alba Longa and it will roll through the generations. So really this is creating a starting point for Augustus's family or Augustus's lineage in the Trojan War. And here, Venus has really compromised and said, don't worry too much about Aeneas, just save Ascanius, because by the way, you promised me that. In book 12, Venus is perhaps a more conscientious mother. So as we're moving through the battle scenes, we can see Venus in turmoil, and it really adds to the drama and the high stakes of the epic. So in book 12, Venus heals Aeneas's battle wound. And we actually see this on Pompeian wall art. There's a beautiful picture of this, which I'll pop up for you now. Bitterly chafing, Aeneas stood propped on his mighty spear amid a great concourse of warriors along with sorrowing Eulus, himself unmoved by their tears. The aged healer with robe rolled back in girt in Pinean fashion, with healing hand and Phoebus potent herbs, worked hard, in vain, in vain with his hand he pulls at the arrow, and with the gripping tongs tugs at the steel. No fortune guides his path, no help does Apollo's counsel give, and more and more the fierce alarm swells over the plains, and disaster draws closer. At this, Venus, shaken by her son's cruel pain, with a mother's care plucks from Cretan Ida Dittany, clothed with downy leaves and purple flower. Just a fun footnote. Dittany appears in Harry Potter. It's not important, it's just interesting. With this water, aged Yapix bathed the wound, unwitting, and suddenly in truth, all pain fled from the body. All blood was staunch deep in the wound. And now, following his hand with no force applied, the harrow fell out, and new strength returned as it was before. 
So this is perhaps the most intimate and maternal intervention that we see from Venus and brings us back to our question at the beginning. Is Aeneas a mama's boy? Actually, I would say probably not. For the simple reason that it's very rare, if ever, that Aeneas asks for any of this help. When we see Venus intervene, it tends to be out of her own concern for him. And it tends to be fairly fair and sensible. She calls upon Troy and the debt of Troy. She calls upon the fatedness of the Roman race. And it's only really actually in this scene we see a mother's care coming into play. In book eight and in book 12, we see Venus getting more involved and having maternal affection for Aeneas. But actually through a lot of the epic, it's not dissimilar to the way that Athena champions Odysseus. So although Virgil creates a divine lineage for Aeneas and Venus definitely punctuates the Aeneid with support for her son, it's not too maternal and it doesn't make Aeneas too much of a mama's boy and too much of a sickly character. And this brings us to just the thing I wanted to close on today, which is the significance of Venus in Rome. In Rome, Venus is worshipped, or was worshipped, I should say, as Venus Genetrix, and there was a temple to Venus the Mother in the Roman Forum. We see Venus appearing on Pompeian wall art, supporting Aeneas and cleaning his wounds. There was a cult for Venus in Rome. She had a religious significance as a Roman goddess, so she's more than the equivalent of the Greek Aphrodite that you might think she is. She has a local significance for Romans who would be reading or listening to Virgil's Aeneid. I hope you enjoyed that video and that it helped you understand the Aeneid a little bit better. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share to keep the channel going. And if you're looking to stock up on any supplies for the new term, why don't you go and have a look at my Redbubble account. I'll pop a link in the description below. Thank you.